Welcome back. We are still at it at the Winter School 2022. That's a GTEC Winter School 2022. As I said, on the social media platforms, we are available. Hashtag GTEC Winter School 2022. I think I got that correct. Please let us know if you're still enjoying. If you are, drop a chat in the chat box just to let us know that you're still alive and you're still with us. You're still keeping the energy going as we go to our final session of the day. Show us some love, reaction emojis, sharp, 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 sharp. Throw some shades as well so we could see that you are indeed still here. I know it has been a long day and we're here to release you with the final most important session that speaks about finance, as I said before the, ad, before the break, that we are sitting with a serious challenge in South Africa of uh, improper municipal, municipal finance uh, management that has grasp our financial uh, system with the horn and it's really giving us a tough time to manage and deliver services to our municipalities. With us to close off the session the, or the person that will facilitate the session is none other than Matt Glazer. Matt is joining us, I understand, from Oregon. I think it's a state in the United States and it's about about nine or so hours uh, behind us is GMT minus seven and South Africa is GMT plus two. So it's really early for Matt, but he did make time to join us uh, this uh, um, afternoon in South Africa to share his thoughts. Just a bit about Matt, for those that may have not met him before, Matt started his professional career as a municipal bond council and city attorney in Colorado. He's the director for municipal law and finance at the Center for Urban Law and Finance in Africa, otherwise known as CULFA. Matt is an extraordinary research fellow of the South African Chair in Cities, uh, Law and Environmental Sustainability at the Northwest University Faculty of Law. He was formerly, uh, formerly a leader of urban, spe uh, urban specialist in the World Bank, where he, man he managed programs in Africa and India. Matt has worked with the National Treasury of South Africa for over or for the past 24 years, advising on local government finances, especially municipal borrowing and financial emergencies. Matt has also worked with local and a number of national governments across the world to help them improve local and intergovernmental finances. His most recent work uh, publications includes the South African municipalities in financial distress, what can be done. Law, Democracy and Development, General of UWC Faculty of Law, the University of Western Cape, as well as municipal bonds in three countries, India, South Africa and the United States, that is in the Journal of Comparative Urban Law and Policy. Matt has also authored Financing the New Urban Agenda, that is a chapter in Law and the New Urban Agenda, as an ed as edited by Davidson and Tewari, uh, published by Rutlek in May 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, as you could hear from this very thick bio that we are so privileged to have our final session and we couldn't wait to save the best for last. And Matt is here to do exactly that, to take over the session and facilitate. Matt, good if well in South Africa, it's good, it's good afternoon. What time is it on your side? Good morning. It's uh, just after 6 a.m. Good morning to you, Matt. And thank you so much for joining us. I trust you well. Thank you very much. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you, and hello, everybody. It's, it's good to be talking to you um, this morning. And what I hope I can do is say a little bit about how South Africa sits in comparison to some other countries and some other municipal finance systems in the world, as well as give you sort of the general backbone and architecture and maybe call out a few of the challenges that I see. I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions or comments, please do put them in the chat and uh, we will take them as we can. Let me uh, load up my file here. So just to say a few things about my background, I started off working in the United States as a city attorney and as a municipal bond attorney. 
And then following the end of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, I started working in Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Bulgaria, some of the countries of the former Eastern Bloc, uh, as they tried to reconstruct their financial systems from a central plan system to a, a more market-oriented system. And then following the end of apartheid, I uh, first came to South Africa in 1998. And what they had asked me to do in South Africa was help them revive the municipal borrowing market because the, the sense at that time was that there were a tremendous number of challenges on government's plate and they were not going to be able to generate all the capital that was needed for local infrastructure. So local governments were going to have to be able to use their resources and borrow in order to build infrastructure. And that's how I, I first came to be working in South Africa. I helped write uh, chapters six and 13 of the MFMA, the Municipal Finance Management Act, which relate to municipal borrowing and to interventions in municipalities that are in distress. I hope that I've advanced the slide and that you're now seeing slide two. I wanna start off by asking what may seem like a simple question. What is a municipality? And then we'll look at what powers and functions municipalities have, because that's the environment within which municipal finance happens. So what is a municipality? One way to think about it is that it's a special kind of corporation in which the citizens are effectively the shareholders the council is effectively the board of directors and the municipal manager is the chief executive officer. And so ultimately the board of directors is accountable to the citizens. The council is accountable to the citizens and then the manager is accountable to the council. And that's the basic structure of accountability that we have in most city councils in the world. And it's the way it works more or less in South Africa. But the powers and functions that municipalities have vary tremendously around the world. It happens that South Africa has, on paper at least, very, very strong municipalities. They're responsible for planning and zoning. They're responsible for uh, streets, for rubbish collection, for water, for sewer, for in many cases now with the municipal police for public safety. Um, there's a tremendous difference between, for example, let's take the municipalities in South Africa and the municipalities in Tanzania. In Tanzania, the municipalities don't do water. They don't do electricity. They do do health and education. South African municipalities don't do health and education, but they do do these other functions. So when you talk about municipal finance and you try to compare country to country around the world, you often stumble because the things that municipalities are meant to do in different countries are actually quite a bit different. So we ask about what's a municipality, then we ask about finance. And finance means what revenue instruments do municipalities have? And how do they spend those? And the question of how they spend those revenues is a question of financial management. I was listening to the uh, prior panel discussion and a lot of the speakers raised issues that are essentially about financial management. Procurement is essentially a financial management issue. Pricing municipal services is a financial management issue. So a lot of the questions that you end up looking at is how well managed are the finances of a municipality? What are the laws and regulations that govern managing the finances of a municipality? How closely are those rules followed in practice? What role should borrowing play? These are all questions that we worry about when we talk about municipal finance. So the most basic way of thinking about municipal finance is where do you get the money? And sometimes we call that funding in order to distinguish from finance. So, what I try to do, and I don't always remember to do this, is funding has to do with where the money comes from. It comes from property tax, or it comes from water rates, or it comes from um, 
other fees and charges that the municipality may have. It comes from transfers from national government, of which there are a couple of kinds, and we'll talk about that. And then the question is, where do they spend the money on? Uh, they spend it on two things. They spend it on operations, keeping the system running, and they spend it on infrastructure investments, things like water treatment plants, sewage treatment plants, roads, things that you don't build afresh every year. You have to maintain them every year. But when you do have to build them, they're very expensive, and you have to figure out how to pay for them over time. The main regulatory framework in South Africa for municipal financial management is the Municipal Finance and Management Act, Municipal Finance Management Act. And it's often spoken of in the same breath as the PFMA, the Public Finance Management Act, which applies to national government and to provinces. But there are some key differences. And a lot of those differences stem from the way the South African Constitution is written. As I'm sure you've heard people say, there are three different spheres of government in South Africa. In most countries, we speak about tiers or levels of government. But the South African Constitution is somewhat unique in the world in that it says we have the local sphere, the provincial sphere, and the national sphere. And each of them has their own duties and responsibilities and is somewhat autonomous with respect to the others. There's this concept of cooperative governance. They're all meant to work together. But the powers that the municipality has, essentially, analytically, legally, historically, are a share of the powers that the king once had. So the sovereign, which in the old days was a king, had all the powers in any government. And then over time, those got divided up. And in South Africa, one way that they're divided up is the things that would relate to local matters, local infrastructure, local planning and zoning, uh, local economic development. Those are municipal functions. The things that relate to national functions, like the national defense, uh, excise taxes, duties, customs, uh, immigration, those are national matters. And then the provincial matters are in between, things like health and education. Municipalities in South Africa generate most of their own revenues. If you take all municipalities in the aggregate, and there are poor municipalities for whom this is not true, but if you look at all municipalities in the aggregate, they generate about 80% of their own revenue. And that means they get 20% from transfers. And the national government makes the rules around which local governments spend that money and collect that money. But the Decisions really about how it's spent depend on the council and how well in touch with its citizens it is. And we'll get to that question about linkages between council and citizens again in a little bit. I wanted to, to put South African municipalities a little bit in context here. Uh, so I've put on the board here three other countries that I've worked in. And you'll see that in every country there is a national government and there's always some sort of state, provincial, or regional government. And then there's the institutions of local government. Now in South Africa, I've only shown the district and local municipalities. And we know that there are also the eight metro municipalities, which essentially combine the powers of the district and the local municipalities. But what's really interesting, and, and again, a bit unique about South Africa, is that the district and local municipalities cover the same territory. So this is really rather unusual in the world in that you have local governments, uh, and this has been a challenge ever since the constitution. How do you divide up what the district's responsible for, what the local government's responsible for? There was a lot of contestation about this, uh, especially right after the December 2000 elections when the current, more or less, local government uh, organization was formed. What should be, should we have strong districts or strong locals was the way that debate was often phrased. And to caricature it a little bit, the National Treasury broadly was in favor of strong locals and the Department of Provincial and Local Government, as it was then known, was largely in favor 
of strong districts. And I would say that over the past couple of decades, at least a ghost of those original positions remains. We know that COGTA is now talking about the district-driven development model, and the Treasury is still very concerned that local municipalities not lose their skills and capacities on which the country has relied for some time. Uh, if you look now at some of the other countries, in Indonesia, there are district governments and there are city governments. And by and large, the city governments are in the urban areas and the district governments are in the rural areas. If we looked at India, it's the same way. The ULBs, or urban local bodies, are in the cities. The panchats are in the rural areas. And in the U.S., it varies tremendously from state to state. But largely, you have cities which are urban and counties which are more rural. Uh, so you see the difference in South Africa is that although you've got two local government structures, they're on top of each other rather than next to each other. And that certainly leads to some complications. And I'm wondering what you all think about that. Is that a good idea to have those two levels of local government operating? We, we talk about three spheres of government, but within the local sphere, there's two tiers. And the division of powers and functions between them is a frequent subject of contestation. Another bit of context that I want to give you uh, has to do especially with money and population, because those are probably the things that vary most from country to country. South Africa is a country of 58 million people. So compare that to India. India is 20 times larger. But in terms of resources per capita GDP, South Africa is three times as rich as India. Um, you can compare South Africa to the US. It's about a sixth the size in terms of people, but it's one tenth the size in terms of money. Saudi Arabia is roughly similar in size to South Africa, but the GDP per capita is about four times as big. So what a given country can provide in terms of services, even with the best management and even with the best tax system, is going to relate to what their GDP per capita is. You, you can't do more than you can afford. And of course, the US didn't start off at $62,000 per capita. Um, we have a, a long history of providing local services before World War I, especially when the country was very poor. And so comparing South Africa to the U.S. is never going to be completely fair to South Africa. Comparing South Africa to India might be a little bit more fair, but you've still got three times the resources that they do. Comparing to Indonesia might be a little more fair, but your population is much smaller. And then when we look at the structure of government, you see that India and the U.S. are federal countries. That means that the states have banded together and delegated some of their powers to the national government. And that's very different from the South African structure, where actually the Constitution devolves some powers to local government. They all start with the sovereign, and then it's devolved down, whereas in the U.S. and in India, the states gathered together and delegated some powers upwards. Saudi Arabia is unique because it's run by a king, and essentially the king says what goes. No matter what the democratic institutions on the side say, the king's power is ultimately what matters. And then across the bottom, you know, I've just characterized these municipalities as weak or strong. And you see that in Indonesia, South Africa, and the U.S., you really have remarkably strong municipalities. And I, when I say strong, I don't necessarily mean that they're providing good services. What I mean is that they have the potential to do so. Or to put it a different way, how well municipalities perform in South Africa, in the U.S., and in Indonesia is largely up to them. National government can't fix local problems in those countries. It has to be fixed at the local level. And I think that's an important insight because there's a lot of talk about national reform this, national reform that in South Africa. In my mind, the real reforms ultimately need to happen at the local level. Any thoughts or questions on any of this, please put them in the chat. 
I've highlighted this slide in yellow because I think it's, it's very important that we always keep these distinctions in mind. On a day-to-day, year-to-year basis, what matters is the operational financial health of the city. Are they collecting local revenues? Own source revenues, again, from property rates, water, electric primarily, and transfers from the national government. And are they spending on operating? And to the extent that they've borrowed money for infrastructure, are they spending on debt service? I want to say a little word about transfers as they operate in South Africa. In the South African constitution, there's a provision that local government as a sphere is entitled to an equitable share of the revenues raised nationally. And it doesn't say much more than that about what is the equitable share. Now in practice, what has developed is a formula that has various components in it that include things like poverty um, and population. So the basic theory of the Constitution was they would give these revenue instruments, again, electric, water, property rates, and some excise taxes. They would give these revenue instruments to municipalities. And those municipalities that didn't have a strong economic base would rely primarily on equitable share transfers from national government. So the thinking was own source revenues for those that have a strong base and equitable shares for those that don't. And then in the middle, you know, as the ability to generate your own revenue goes up, your equitable share goes down. Now, the way the formula has actually developed in practice, the vast majority of equitable share transfers actually goes to the metros, which have the most ability to raise their own revenues. And that's because they also have the most people. But one could question whether that's really fair to the people who live in the poorer rural areas who were promised an equitable share of local revenues. The other important transfer stream besides the equitable share is conditional transfers. Now, the conditional transfers were really not a factor in the South African intergovernmental architecture until the run up to the World Cup in 2010. And then the national government was getting a little panicked because they had taken on the responsibility to host the World Cup, but the municipalities weren't seeing it in their interest to build stadiums or to build BRTs to get people to the stadiums. So the national government said, okay, if we want this stuff to happen, we have to do some conditional transfers so that stadiums and BRTs get built. And that was sort of the wedge in the door, after that initial set of conditional transfers, they bloomed. And there, there's graphs that uh, the Treasury could provide you with, or if you want me to provide them, I'd be happy to if you want to write me, that show how the uh, transfers, the conditional transfers have just exploded. And one thing that that has done, which I think is very unfortunate, is that it's turned the local government officials from looking outward to their citizens, to their residents, to the firms operating in their city, looking to see what their needs are. And instead they're looking upward to see how they fill out the applications for conditional grants, how they fill out the reports on conditional grants, how they can grab the money because it's free money from national government. So the orientation of local government and the accountability of local government has shifted over the last 10 or 12 years from downward and outward accountability to upward looking accountability as they seek to get these conditional grants. And that's one of the most unfortunate things that I think has happened in local government finance. Um, there is a question that came in from Sama Bodlani. Doesn't the Municipal Systems Act clearly demarcate between the two spheres? Not really. Uh, the Municipal Systems Act actually says that the minister responsible for local government will say, and, and the most important function that differentiates different kinds of local municipalities is who's responsible for water service. And uh, historically, 
as we approached the December 2000 demarcation, there was a sort of panic to quickly demarcate. And uh, the Department of Provincial and Local Government sent out teams to every municipality and they made some back of the envelope judgments about where the capacity was and said, okay, here, this is going to be a local function here. This is going to be a district function. And some of that's moved around about in the years since, but it hasn't, it hasn't really, um, nobody's really asked the question, why do we need two levels? And I think that's, that's the fundamental question that I would ask. Uh, it's tremendously expensive administratively to run two levels of local government. And it doesn't seem to improve accountability. It doesn't seem to improve administration. And in the areas where the local authorities are the service authorities for water and electricity, there's really not much for the district to do, uh, except to collect salaries and hear opinions. Um, so it, it's, you know, this is a personal opinion. It in no sense represents any government of South Africa opinion or any other government. But I, I think that having two levels of government greatly increases the administrative cost of local government and dilutes the responsiveness of local government. Um, let me come to some of these other questions. Let me, let me uh, go ahead with some slides for right now. These are, this is a quick series of slides and I just want to maybe detail a little bit of what I've already said. If you look at any local government budget, and remember, every government, ha every local government has to adopt a budget. And please remember that a budget is only a plan. And plans sometimes need to change in response to exterior events like COVID. But every local government has revenues and it's got expenditures. And if we go, just run down the left side here, taxes include property tax. Um, use. In, in almost every country in the world, local governments have a business tax. In South Africa, they don't. And I think that's a bit of a, a problem because it means that local governments don't have a stake in the success of the firms operating in their municipality. Uh, we've all seen the newspaper stories about firms like um, Astral Poultry or Clover Dairy that can no longer function in the municipality that they've had their factory in for, for generations because the water's not reliable, the electricity is not reliable, the streets are full of potholes, they can't get their product out, and so they close down. And when firms close down in a municipality, you know, it's obviously jobs, it's a source of livelihood for the employees and their families, and for all the people that rely on the money that those people spend for the grocer, for the butcher, for the car mechanic, for everybody that serves those employees that have income from the factory. So it's been the failure of municipalities, of many municipalities in South Africa, is really what's behind the collapse of per capita GDP in South Africa and the collapse of the economy. The uh, IMF put out a chart last year that showed the medium per capita GDP in South Africa from say 94 to, through 2008 was about the world average. So, and it was growing. So in half the countries of the world, you're at the median, in half the countries of the world, people are on average richer than South Africa and in half the country people are poorer than South Africa. In 2008, there was a big financial crisis and both South Africa and the world suffered a drop. And then after the crisis was over, the rest of the world took off and continued to grow. And South Africa, and this was roughly aligned with the Zuma administration, plateaued and then fell. So that today, South Africa is no longer at the median with half of the world above us and half below. It's now in the bottom 25th percentile. So three quarters of the world now is richer than South Africa and a quarter is poor. That's an astonishing deterioration. And to me, it's largely due to the industrial collapse that has happened in municipalities because of the unreliability 
of water and electricity and streets and so on. If we don't get local government working, we cannot be economically successful. Full stop. Um, it, the local governments are at the coal face. They're the ones that provide the services to the businesses. So that's why, to me, a business tax is important. If you have a business tax, and there used to be something called the RSC levy, which was gotten away with because there were constitutional problems with it. And when it was done away with, there was a promise that there would be a business tax to replace it. And that, uh, more than a decade later, has never happened. There was a bit of the fuel levy that was given to municipalities, but it was never anything like what the business tax would be. So this disconnect between the cities not having a stake, the municipalities not having a stake in the success of their businesses, is in my judgment responsible for the way the industrial capacity of South Africa is falling. Then there's the fees, and um, I heard some discussion about that with Andrew Donaldson and others, you know, how, how much of the cost do you pass on the marginal cost? Uh, ultimately, the water system has to pay for itself. So it's not a question of what do you charge, it's more a question of who do you charge? Uh, and if you're not gonna charge the users, then you need to charge the rest of the country, you know, in the form of their income tax that goes to the national government and is redistributed out as a subsidy or their property tax that goes to the city and then is redistributed out as a subsidy. But somebody has to pay for it if you want 24 seven reliable water and electricity, which, you know, in the 21st century, you absolutely need. I've already said uh, about the transfers on the expenditure side, you've got your operating expenditure, your current expenditure, salaries, supplies, O&M. And if you have borrowed for infrastructure, you've got the debt service. Uh, and then if you want to improve your city, you need to spend money on capital. In the early days after the fall of apartheid, the emphasis is on people who never had service, who never had reliable good service. And the, the whole emphasis for the first let's say decade after democracy was on extending services to those who were not served. But eventually focusing on that expansion led to a deterioration in the core infrastructure, the water treatment plants themselves, the sewage treatment plants themselves, not the service lines, but the core infrastructure that's needed for everybody to the point you know where we now have too many sewer plants that are dumping raw sewage into rivers, too many uh, electrical facilities that are not providing electricity and so on. So you always have to be thinking about investment of three kinds, in my view. You have to be extending service to the people who don't have service and improving service to the people who have substandard service. That's, that's the backlog problem. You have to be paying attention to the useful life of your facilities and when they're going to need replacement or repair because they may be designed to last for 30 or 40 years, but they will wear out. And you have to be building reserve capacity so that if somebody wants to come open a factory in your town, there's the ability to serve them. You don't have to say to them, go away, we, don't have, we can't have your factory here, we don't have the ability to serve it. Because when they can't locate in your town, they'll locate in another town. And if they can't locate in South Africa, they'll go to another country. So you, you have to have high quality services if you want economic development. Um, I want to do at least uh, two more slides before I, I turn to the questions. Um, and then we'll see where we go. Uh, one thing that I've thought a lot about as I've looked at local government in lots of different countries in the world has to do with what is the social contract or what is the social understanding between people and their local government? Do the people and those who are officials share the same model, the same intellectual model, the same paradigm as to what the local government is supposed to be doing? How is local government understood? Is it understood as something which provides the economic base for the country? Is it understood as something which ensures that you get good services? 
are public officials understood as public servants? Or from the point of view of some political parties, are local officials understood as a way to get their hands on public resources to support individuals and the parties? I mean, in, in many countries in the world, South Africa is not unique in this, the value of a councillor to his or her political party is that they can lay their hands on public monies and perhaps divert some of them to friends of the party. And that's, that's part of the culture in some countries. And where it's part of the culture, you will get corruption. You will get diversion of public resources. So, so you have to think about this as not just a sort of technical financial, what does the MFMA say? You have to think about it as an anthropo anthropological cultural question. How do we want our society to conceive of governments? Um, the legal and financial tools you have depend on the political culture. And, and so anytime somebody comes along and says, well, it's clear what we have to do here. You know, we have to restructure the local water utilities so that they're less um, beholden to the politicians. You know, that sounds like a good idea, but in my experience around the world, it doesn't really change the outcome. Beware of magic bullets understand the incentives that there are. And here's a, here's a little graphic from a paper I did recently uh, for the World Bank and for the Ministry of Urban Housing in India. They asked me to look at models for delivering local services in different countries. So I looked at India, the United States, and South Africa. And I want to just compare, the, I looked at eight different institutions, um, I'm sorry, eight different cities and two services in each city. But I want to just compare the Chicago and the Johannesburg water accountability systems, if you will. In Chicago, the citizens elect the mayor directly. The mayor, Lori Lightfoot, is now the mayor of Chicago because she got the vote of the majority of citizens, no political party. Just she got the vote. The aldermen, there are 55 districts in Chicago. They are also elected directly by the vote of the people in their district. Again, the political party doesn't matter in Chicago. Everybody is a Democrat. So they're not elected because they're ANC, DA, or EFF, because they're Republican or Democrat. They're elected because the majority of people in that district believe that this alderman, can effectively represent them. And there's downsides to that as well. You know, the people talk about machine politics in Chicago, but it, if I'm a citizen in Chicago, I know the mayor cares about my vote because she's only there because a majority of us voted for her. I know my alderman cares deeply about my vote because he or she is only there because a majority of people in the district voted for him. And it's got nothing to do with political parties. The mayor then nominates and the council appoints department heads that run the various city departments, including the Chicago Water Department, which provides water not only to Chicago, but also to 123 neighboring jurisdictions. And so if I've got a problem with my water service, I will be down at my alderman's office and he or she is going to ensure that my water service is restored promptly. Chicago has the best water service in the United States and some of the best in, in the world. And to my way of thinking, it's because of this direct linkage between the citizens, their elected representatives, and the department heads. Now compare that with Johannesburg. In Johannesburg, you vote for the municipal council, but you're not really voting. There, there are ward councilors, and then there are the party list councilors. But even the uh, ward councilors are the member of a political party. And if they're an ANC counselor, they're expected to vote the way the ANC tells them to vote. Um, and so on for the other political parties. So you're, you're voting not for an individual, but for a party. Those counselors then vote for a mayor, and that mayor then appoints a manager. And in the case of Joe Birdwater, they then appoint a board of directors. And then that board of directors appoints a managing director, and then that managing director appoints a department head. 
so I think you can see by the length of this accountability chain how attenuated accountability to the citizens actually is in Johannesburg. And I think this is a big reason. It, the, the failures in service delivery in South Africa don't really have to do with the pricing. They really have to do with the political failure, the disconnect between the city officials and the citizens. Um, I see that the, the uh, speaker box has come up on my screen and I suspect uh, they're trying to tell me that I'm actually out of time. Um, let's see, uh, if, if nobody stops me, I'm going to start looking at some of the questions on the side. The next, the next portion, which I am obviously not going to get to, was about municipal borrowing and how that works. Um, there, there's a question, Tumelo Motsepe asks, how should land be um, acquired? And, you know, I think the way it works in South Africa is broadly the way it works in most countries. If there's a public need for land, and there's different rules about what constitutes a public need in different places, they can acquire that on paying fair compensation. And in most countries, that means fair market value. In some cases, it may not mean fair market value because of historical circumstances, and I think South Africa would qualify there. Uh, the, um, the, the municipal need for land, especially for things like public housing, is quite a conundrum in South Africa because you have so much public land which is owned by state-owned enterprises or by national or provincial government, some of it very well located, owned by railroads and so on, which could be used, which is well-placed, well-situated, which could be used to house poor people closer to jobs, closer to opportunities in well-serviced areas near the city, but because they're carrying it on their books at a value, these enterprises, which I'm generalizing, don't hesitate to come back constantly to national government for more and more and more money, are very reluctant to give up any of their precious land for public purposes. So, you know, it seems to me like, you know, if we're going to talk about cooperative governance, uh, any entity, if it's, if it's PRASA, if it's SAA, if it's uh, Transnet, um, if it's Donnell that wants to have funding from the national government should also be thinking about what it can do for the people of South Africa in terms of land. Um, uh, Songezo asked a question, what's the best way to provide for fiscal development agendas in a country? My observation and this was, this was what I learned from that paper that I did on comparing the different service delivery institutions in different countries, is in some ways it doesn't really matter if it's federal or unitary. It doesn't really matter if you're using a municipal department like Cape Town does or a municipal entity like Joburg does or a PPP, um, as we have a few examples in South Africa. What really matters is how this chain of accountability works. What really matters is whether the people who are being served have an effective voice in the people who are providing them service and the quality of the service. It's, it's about uh, voice and accountability. It's about participation. And that's a two-way street. It not only means that the municipality or the service delivery entity must be asking for input. It also means that the people must be empowered and prepared to give input. Uh, and civil society plays a huge role here in being able, there's an information asymmetry problem, right? The city has accountants and lawyers and engineers to talk about how its fees are structured. But the, um, the citizen organizations often don't have those skills. So I think if we wanted a more robust system, more could be done to empower civic organizations in South Africa. I think you all know this better than I do, but with the coming of democracy, there was sort of an attitude, okay, the work of the civics is done. 
now now we're in government, so we don't need the civics anymore. And that was probably, in retrospect, a mistake. Um, let's see. I want to see what it says. Okay, the speaker, they've, they've told me I can go ahead a bit. So until they further say I must stop, I want to move on a bit into municipal borrowing and the role of borrowing in municipal finance. And I, and I want to talk about principles here. Um, one, one of the most important is that borrowing is not a new source of money. It's only a way to access your future monies today. And then you're going to have to pay it back. So borrowing can be a very powerful tool for the good if it's wisely used. And it can be a tremendously damaging thing if it's used unwisely. If we look at the world today, there is more sovereign debt than there has been, adjusted for inflation, there's more sovereign debt outstanding in the world today than there's been since the end of World War II. We're in a tremendously debt-driven global economy right now. And that's precarious. There, there is definitely such a thing as overborrowing. When South Africa first considered the rules for municipal borrowing uh, back in the 1998 to 2000 period, one of the big concerns was that municipalities not overborrow. And the solution that South Africa came up for that was to put the risk on lenders. So if somebody wants to lend to the municipality, they need to do their due diligence. They need to engage with the municipality. They need to see if the revenues are sufficient to support the debt that's being taken on. There's not a push on municipalities to borrow, especially if they can't afford it. And so far, that principle has kept South African municipalities from being over indebted, uh, in contrast to many other countries in the world. Um, there are two types of borrowing. Short-term borrowing for cash flow, you know, if your property taxes come in in April, but you need to start building in January, you can borrow for 90 days. You just have to pay it back within the fiscal year. And that's in your cash management, and it's not particularly impactful one way or the other. But the most impactful form of borrowing is when you engage in long-term borrowing, multi-year to finance assets. Most South African municipalities have a lot of additional capacity to borrow, even now. Financial capacity to borrow. Where they are weak now is on the financial management. Municipalities are not doing an adequate job of thinking ahead. Where do we need to be in terms of economic development? Where do we need to be in terms of our aging infrastructure? Where do we need to be in terms of backlog that's not yet been addressed? How are we going to meet these needs over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And how are we going to pay that money back? Uh, a, and a critically important principle is that you borrow to finance capital investment, not to support the current operating budget. If you borrow to support the current operating budget, then you're going to have to borrow more next year and the year after and the year after that, and you're going down a road to financial hell. Uh, in general, borrowing should match the, asphal life, the useful life of the asset. Um, I see that uh, I'm supposed to start wrapping up, so let me hit a few more things. All of this presentation, by the way, is available to you, and if anybody wants to interact with me about any of the issues that I've raised, I'm more than happy to engage with you um, by email, text, uh, a video call, whatever, whatever is useful to you. Uh, let me maybe just wrap up. With this slide and the one after. If you're trying to build a municipal borrowing ecosystem in which financially healthy municipalities borrow for necessary infrastructure. You have to have a good regulatory and legal framework. 
And I think South Africa has that. In fact, it's often envied and copied by other countries in the world. So you've, you've got a state-of-the-art regulatory and legal framework. You have to have investors and lenders with capital. And South Africa's financial institutions are really among some of the best in the world. So you've, and you've got tremendous access to capital. And you have to have credit-worthy borrowers. And that's where I think South Africa is not yet where it needs to be. The um, reference was made to, uh, I forget the number that somebody used, I think it was 87 municipalities that the Auditor General has found in financial distress. The National Treasury actually thinks that there are more than that. If you look at the National Treasury website, there's a page where they list the indicators of municipalities that are candidates for intervention because they're in financial distress. And last time I looked, the number was more like 120. So this needs to be taken quite seriously. Uh, the provincial government has the first responsibility to intervene. If they cannot or won't, then the national government must intervene constitutionally. And one of the interesting new things that's happening and I have a colleague at the Northwest School of Northwest University School of Law named Johandry Wright, who's recently written an article on citizen actions to force interventions. I think that's an interesting new area of the law, um, which shows some promise. When there are interventions, there must be a financial recovery plan, and the council must follow it. So I think it's just a question of convincing the political leadership at the provincial and national level that the people insist on good financial management. And uh, it's within reach. It's within reach. This last slide that I'll leave you with, um, that's not actually the one I meant, is this one, which tries to take a systemic look at what you need for infrastructure finance. And again, it's not a magic bullet. It's a combination of a whole lot of things that work together. So you have strong institutions on the financial side, strong institutions on the government side. You've got a solid regulatory framework. And especially for municipalities that don't borrow regular, regularly, you need to have some independent neutral financial advice. This is one of the big things that's come on in the United States over the past two or three years. Uh, in the US, municipalities used to rely on financial advice from the very people they were borrowing from, from the investment bankers. And in South Africa, that's still the case. Uh, when you have a municipality that might borrow once every five or 10 years, it's at a tremendous information disadvantage compared to a financial institution that deals with loans like this every single day of the year. So you need to level that playing field. You need to build up the capacity of municipal CFOs, many of whom are mostly accountants rather than financial thinkers. And to the extent that the capacity isn't in-house, you need to seek out independent financial advice. You'll pay a fee for it, but you'd rather pay a fee directly and honestly and openly for the advice than have that fee hidden in the unfavorable terms of the deal that you enter into. Uh, a lot more to say, but, but time is up and I know you've had a long day. So thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all the best. Lucy, back to you. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, that was quite insightful from you. Uh, we, we learned a lot, you know, some of the things that we they didn't take into account how um, you know our financial system is so advanced and is competitive to the global economy and how our municipalities can have access to those capital markets. And that comparison with Tanzania was quite striking as well, understanding the two uh, differences, how municipalities are perceived around the world. Whilst we provide water, they do provide education and health. And really, you quite hit it on the head when you say definitely we need uh, for development, municipalities need to up their game and deliver high quality services. Thank you so much for that. We highly appreciate your presence. Down in Oregon, or should I say up 
at Oregon uh, in the United States. <laughs> yes, up in Oregon in the United States. Thank you for that insightful and really taking your time um, to join us in the very early morning of, of time in that part of the world. Uh, thank you so much to uh, our uh, participants that were in this call, particular session with Matt, uh, and have stayed through, listened, contributed, special uh, uh, shout out to, I think it's Hashele, and we did have Songezo, Tumelo and Zama that did ask questions and Matt responded to them, to the questions. Thank you so much for that participation. All right, um, we are at the end of our session. But before we leave, I'll need you to do me a favor. Uh, there is a new interesting feature that has been added into your um, facility there. On your little bit top right corner, um, there is a puzzle looking like a symbol. That is a survey. You could please, if you are so kind, uh, complete that survey, giving a survey for the entire session of today as well as do a poll that will be uh, shared in your screen for us to get a sense of how we did um, for the day. And talking about how we did for the day, just a few highlights of what we did before we leave. Um, remember, we started by the head, acting head of GTEC, Ronette. Uh, Angela, Ronette Angela just uh, told us about a lot of things about the program, really warmly welcomed us. She did tell us about how the GTEC program has evolved over time since the conceptualization in 2014. We did have uh, um, Ismail Momaniat, if you remember how he was not uh, uh, you know, pulling any punches and really taking corruption uh, and taking all the things that need to be heard out there, emphasizing the challenges of the climate change and how they impact our infrastructure. Chanda came in, thank you so much Chanda, for the role of the renewables um, in South African municipalities and how uh, renewable infrastructure can be financed and how can it can be enhanced to ensure that we are in a sustainable and environmentally friendly environment. Um, we did have uh, three speakers back to back. Uh, that was quite a fascinating session with um, professors Ivo Chipkin, Ivan Turok, as well as Andrew Donaldson, really giving us a conceptual understanding of um, the infrastructure challenges. They looked at how government institutions have contributed to the local economy and infrastructure in particular, or lack thereof. And remember the two terms that we introduced to you, diversification and intensification of the townships. Also, um, Ivo coming very harshly there on the impact of corruption. Pule did give us some good framework on how local government infrastructure is financed and how um, are all those service delivery mechanisms that are used by uh, the national treasury and government in particular to ensure that we get delivered the infrastructure that we need. Do you remember how David and the panel did take us through? I'm talking about David Tando, Pule and Andrew. Yes, they did share with us very interesting nuggets on the municipal infrastructure, governance and expenditure. And I hope like myself, you did learn a thing or two, of course, closing it off with Matt, uh, that's giving us a very good view of fiscal design and financial management in municipality, not only in South Africa, but giving us a comparative and a global view of how other municipalities uh, do uh, perform or handle their uh, uh, affairs in the other parts of the world, including Tanzania and other states such as California. I thank all the participants, I mean, all the guest speakers that took time to come and join us in the studio or online. We greatly appreciate it, your time. Uh, it's, uh, it's warmly appreciated from our side, as well as all the organizers here. Oh, there's a lot of applause that are coming on the charts. I love that, and the love that you show. I really, I really wanna, I really wanna thank you, um, you in particular for first waking up in the morning, pressing the button, and joining in the session. Secondly, for staying throughout the short breaks that we had and being part of this session. Lastly, but not least, thank you profusely for your active engagements on the platform and elsewhere on social media. Thank you so much for that um, uh, participation. So today was day one, right? We have day two and we'll have day three. So tomorrow you don't wanna miss the first session that we're gonna have. We're gonna have Hossi Ansue Ramokhopa, who is the currently in the um, head of infrastructure at the president. He will give us a very good uh, 
uh, some very early morning things to think about when it comes to infrastructure development and how is the government thinking around that. You don't want to miss what we and when we zoom in into infrastructure and service delivery in some of the big metros and cities. Please join us in a fascinating interactive session where you'll get a part to understand what we call system designs and we'll have that session later on in the afternoon tomorrow and there is some good surprise for you we have some students that left south africa for the united states they are back in south africa and they want to share us with us all the opportunities that they got and how we can be part of it so tomorrow don't miss the session we're looking forward once again to see you tomorrow and once again thank you so much for being with us today from my side it has been a pleasing pleasure and a privilege being with you today see you tomorrow